Religion to me is really about what it means to be human. It's a language for humans about understanding what it means to be human. And so because I got to sit with my university chaplain and he helped me so much, I wanted to be able to sit with young people and help them. And so I think we all do this in some ways. We have people who mentor us or inspire us or help us. And then we want to pay it forward. We want to mentor, inspire and help the next generation. And that's how my journey progressed. Where are today's, I'm almost, yeah. because I've struggled mightily too, but where yeah. are today's young people at? Welcome to the Wheel With It podcast with your host, Devin. Let's get into the episode. Hello, hello to another episode of Wheel With It. I am so excited because we have a guest that I have admired ever since I heard him on Victoria Garrick Brown's Real Pod. Please welcome the religious dean of USC and a bunch of other things, Dr. Varun Sony. How are Thank you, you today, Varun? Wonderful. <laughs> it's, it's such a joy and a gift to be speaking with you. Thank you for this invitation. So I was doing a little bit of research on you. I don't like to do too much research on the guests because I, I like the conversation to just go where it goes. But what haven't you done is pretty much the, the question I have. So tell us about yourself, but a little bit about what you've done. Sure. I'm an old man now. I've had a more life experience, but I, the things that I've done that I'm most proud of in my career is just working with young people um, in my role as Dean of Religious and Spiritual Life. I'm essentially the university chaplain. So I get to walk alongside young people during their spiritual journeys. Uh, that means that I get to celebrate their triumphs and I also get to be there during their tragedies. And I've done this at USC for about 15 years. I've met literally thousands of students. I think I learn more from them than they learn from me. But just being able to talk about the things that matter with uh, young people has been the great gift of my job. Martin Luther King Jr. once said that our lives begin to end the day we stop talking about things that matter. And so I'm really lucky that I get to be in this position where my job is to encourage young people to think about things that really matter. Which is, that is already an amazing answer. Tell us how you got into this and then a, a little bit about where young people are at right now. Yeah, that's, these are, that's a great question. How did I get into this? I still wonder <laughs> about that. I have 12 physicians in my family, so it, this was not the path that I was expected to take. My PhD means nothing to anyone in my family. No one calls me doctor, not even my kids. But I, it was an unusual path. And I think the way I got into it was I grew up as an immigrant in the United States at a time when there weren't a lot of Indians in the public sphere. We had Deepak Chopra and Apu from The Simpsons, and that was it. So we were really confused. <laughs> wow, we that, those are two opposites. <laughs> <laughs> two opposites. Wow. Nowadays, young Indians in the United States have so many role models in every, in every profession. But when we were growing up, we didn't know what it meant to be Indian, and we didn't know what it meant to be American. We felt like we were neither here nor there. And so much of my young life was just trying to figure out my own identity and in doing so, I started to take classes about the religions of India, and then I went down the rabbit hole of learning um, more and more, lived in India for a while, and then realized that actually the things I was looking for had nothing to do with being Indian or American. They were really focused, I was really focused on what it meant to be a human being. And the one of the great mentors in my life was my university chaplain in college, and I used to go to his office and sit with him and think deeply about what does it mean to be a human being? And for me, religion is not, is not about what it means to be God. Religion to me is really about what it means to be human. It's a language for humans about understanding what it means to be human. And so because I got to sit with my university chaplain and he helped me so much, I wanted to be able to sit with young people and help them. And so I think we all do this in some ways. We have people who mentor us or inspire us or help us. And then we want to pay it forward. We want to mentor, inspire, and help the next generation. And that's how my journey progressed. Where are today's, I'm almost, yeah, because I've struggled mightily too, but where yeah. are today's young people at? <laughs> Here's what I, I see. I see today's young people, Generation Gen Z, post-millennials, I see them as the most empathetic generation I've ever seen. They care about each other more than they any are. generation I've ever seen. And we, that is- We get ratted on for being selfish. I'm like, you are no, not- I don't see that. that. We will 
bend over backwards and it'll end up being an Instagram scam. So <laughs> I I wish more generations cared as much about each other as this generation cares about each other. Whenever I get like letters or petitions in my role at USC, what I've realized is students are never writing to me about themselves or advocating for themselves. They're always writing to me or advocating for someone else, which I think is beautiful. So your generation really cares about one another. That's your superpower. But what I also see is your generation is lonelier than any generation that I think I've seen. And that to me is a real challenge. That loneliness means that young people don't feel seen and heard. Sometimes it means they don't feel like they belong. It means it feels like everyone's figured it out, but them young people can feel like imposters because they think everyone's figured it out, but them. And so I, I am really concerned about the disconnection, the loneliness, the anxiety that I see in young people, even though I totally embrace and applaud and am inspired by the empathy and care and compassion I see in them. Yes, because a lot of Gen Xers will like just say stuff and be like, oh, that was just a joke. And I'm not saying like we can't have humor or anything, but I'll be like, that is not a joke, or at least that's not funny. And nobody has time. Nobody wants to hear any of that, honestly. Yeah. They don't even want to hear that on their reality TV anymore, which is why so many of these CBS reality shows now have conduct codes and all that. That's, uh, it's not funny at all. And, but then we were like, oh, like, I don't have the perfect, and I've fallen into the, I don't have the perfect, like, Instagram husband or wh whatever. Yeah, it's, it's that's right. Crazy. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. And I think that's, I think social media has been, is it like many things as a tool, it can be used for good things. It can be used in ways that are, I think, less helpful. And you're right. It, it's been incredible in terms of advocating for others, deconstructing stereotypes, calling out toxic language, racist, xenophobic, misogynistic, transphobic language, and action. We've never had an opportunity or a tool that allowed us to do that in the way that social media does. But at the same time, if you're constantly comparing your real life with the Instagram curated lives of others, you're going to feel terrible about yourself because comparison is the thief of joy. And what we see on social isn't really what people live. And I think there's a false narrative out there that makes people feel bad about themselves because of what they see. And I think that's what social media is designed to do. It's designed to keep people outraged and anxious and coming back for more. And so I am concerned about that. I, I, I think the tool that allows us to be more inclusive, more connected, more um, empathetic is also the tool that might make us feel less than in, like an imposter, like we don't belong, like everyone's figured it out but us. So I can see, I see both sides of it. Yeah. So talk specifically about, talk a little bit more about social media and what that's doing yeah. and what needs to be changed. Yeah. So your generation is the first generation to be born and raised in a social media and fully digital native environment. And so we've never seen this before in the history of humankind. We talk with our tongues and now students are talking with their thumbs. And it's a very different way to be in community. And it's a very different way to be in relationships with each other. My, my sense is that social media, uh, the, I, the promise of social media is to connect people but I fear the reality of social media is to make people antisocial or disconnected. We know that young people don't go out as much. They're not as in community as much. They don't drive as much. They don't date as much. They're not hanging out as much um, because they're online with each other. And I think we miss something uh, in terms of what it means to be human if we're not seen and heard in person. Many of us saw that during COVID when we all had to go on Zoom. We got a taste of what your generation has been raised with. And seeing everyone in two dimensions instead of three dimensions made all of us anxious, quite frankly. All of us felt disconnected, not just young people during the pandemic. And so I, I think there'll be a corrective at some point, but we're in this transition period where we don't really know what the longitudinal impact of these devices are. We just know that so far we've seen a rise of anxiety, depression, and other negative mental health sort of traits since the release of the iPhone and the advent of social media. Yes, because this is gonna sound crazy. The older people listening are probably gonna be like, 
rolling their eyes at this, but all we had was Facebook yeah. and smartphones didn't, I had a cell phone, like all my friends did because cell phones are cool, but smartphones didn't come out till my freshman year and all the social media apps. And then all we had was Facebook. So all the social media apps didn't become widely proliferated till my junior, senior year of high school. So we were like the last generation that had to hang out. And now our generation, it doesn't seem like can even hang out because we adapted all the social media apps and my eating disorders and depression and all that stuff. And it's just, God, what? what? Yeah. Yeah, I I think to your point, uh, I, I was talking to sh with Sean Parker about this. He was one of the founders of Facebook. And he said that when they built Facebook, they really wanted to create community and intimacy. And they wanted a place where people felt like they belonged. And what changed was the advent of the like button. As soon as they added the like button, it became this sort of a dopamine rush, almost like an addictive drug where people were so focused on getting likes. He said that's what changed the equation for him. And then he began to see Facebook as something that connected people to something that was actually negatively impacting the mental health of a generation. Which is crazy. That one little button. Yeah, and I, whole I, button. I, I, I'm done, yeah, one little button and it's like, it destroys the whole thing. And I've been so obsessed with it. I've had to like actively discipline myself not to break on the podcast because I'm like, I only have to 10 consistent listeners I have no I'm making no money off this and then there's all these tiktokers I'm not saying this in a shaming way with half their clothes off and all this and they're getting sponsorship level kind of likes and I'm like okay I cannot compare myself to those people it takes a while for a business to grow I've already had some fantastic guests on here it'll grow but it's just it's so the comparison trap is just amazingly tempting. Yeah. I, I, two things about that. One is that I used to think it was all about the qu qu quantity of people. Whenever I do a program event, if there were a lot of people, it was, I felt like it was successful. And if there weren't, I felt like it wasn't, but I don't think that anymore. I really think it's about the quality and the depth of your impact. And so I'd rather have five people at my event whose lives are changed than 200 people at my event who are totally tuned out and don't remember a thing. And so I think that's the kind of conversation you're probably having with your, your audience. You're going really deep with people in a way that can be transformative as opposed to broad. And I think there's, that's really important and it's the right way to start uh, the conversation. The second thing is all these TikTokers who have hundreds of thousands or millions of views are also, we assume that because they're quote unquote, successful in social media, then they're happy, they're flourishing, they're excited. They're not. I talk to them too. <sighs> they are all looking at the people who have tens of millions or hundreds of millions of views and feel like they're yeah. imposters. And what about me? And they're anxious that maybe the next video won't get as many views. And what if I lose my audience? And so they're not happy either. They're also feeling the things that other people are feeling. They're also comparing themselves to others in ways that are toxic and unhealthy. And so it's not, there's no there there. You're not going to get to a place where you have all the listeners you want and feel good about it. You're still going to be saying, what, what about more? What, it's an itch that you can never scratch fully. It'll always itch. And so you just have to think about why, how you get to, how you think about the itch itself, as opposed to trying to solve the itch. Heard the churn. Do young people, are they still interested in religion? It's a great question. I, my, my experience is that not really. They're not as interested in religion as previous generations, that's for sure. I think there are different re regional aspects to this. You might find different regions or communities in the United States where it's different. But here at USC, 51% of our first-year students are not religious, compared to probably 5% or less of their grandparents. So in just two generations, we've gone from 5% of the people who weren't religious to 50% of the people who weren't religious. In another 15 years, it'll probably be 75% of our students who are, or young people who are not religious. Those who are not religious, that's the fastest growing religious community in the country. Young people are walking away from religion in numbers that we've never seen before. The United States will no longer be a predominantly religious country in the way that it has 
And, and that's a, it's a big story that not a lot of people are talking about, that we are seeing the biggest shift in religious identity in American history in real time. So why do you think that is? And then I'll... I, 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 think, I, think it's, I think there are a lot of reasons. One of the reasons is that I think some young people just weren't raised with religion. So it's not that they're walking away from religion. They just weren't raised with it. But another, I think, aspect is that young people are distrustful of religion because they see the hypocrisy in religion. They see religion say one thing, and then they see religious people do something else. They see religion talk about love and peace and service and community and dignity and grace and beauty. And they see religious people who are casteist, misogynistic, anti-LGBTQ, who promote religious violence, who cover up child abuse. Etc. And so I had a I have a very kind church. So I never experienced this to a large degree in religious settings, but who are ableists as well. They'll come up and be like, Can I pray? People come up to me and be like, Can I pray for you to be healed? No, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so that's 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 exactly right. And so that's the experience of young people. Lim, can I ask you a question? Yes. You're, were you born and raised in the church and are you still a member? I would, I say I was basically raised in it because my parents aren't necessarily religious, but I had an eight and sixth grade who was a pastor's wife. And she, I think there are a few people on this earth that can talk to animals and she's one of them. Okay. Mm -hmm. She's very nice. But yes, in sixth grade grade I was basically had a lot of like religious influence I would say yes and no kind of and, and you're still a member of your church right yes and yeah. I'm not I don't go as often as I did but I would say it's a complicated question because yeah. I've had to work through a lot of it but w would you um, consider yourself religious do you have a religious identity that's I would say yes, but it's very different now than it was. <laughs> yeah. So I guess my last question to you is a lot of people ask why young people are leaving religion. I, my question would be, why did you stay? I, I just couldn't imagine leaving it because yeah. it was yeah. such a pivotal part of my life. Going that's up. right. So I, I think that's right. That's the same with me. I, I obviously see how religion has not lived up to its aspirations, but I do think religion historically has provided these protective factors, meaning, purpose, community, a reality greater than ourselves, a sense of awe and beauty, songs and stories to live by, ethical framework uh, to think about right and wrong. Those are important for us as humans. And if we don't get that from religion, we have to get that from another place. And I think what we've done is a lot of people have left religion, but we haven't figured out where to get this stuff from now. We need, and that's going to take some time. Yeah. And I've been waiting for a chance to talk about this other podcast, but have you ever heard, you need to listen to this. This is like required listening for you. This is okay. your, oh my God, you gotta put me to work. The Dear Alana podcast. Have you have heard not, of it? No, but I'm always looking for new podcasts. So I will listen. Okay. So Dear Alana is I could so relate to her because I'm not a perfectionist in my real life, but in my religious life, I was a perfectionist. Like you have to follow every rule, like no getting drunk, even if it's on accident. So like ter terrified of alcohol, no this, no sex before me, nothing. And what the podcast is about is this girl who she was raised in a Catholic family, technically, but her parents weren't really strict about it. Her parents were observant, but not really the, the best way I can describe it. But she got really into it. She wanted to be a nun, all of this stuff, it, but she was attracted to women. And basically, she felt so she covertly received conversion therapy and committed suicide. Basically, it's going through like how, why she did what she did and what went up to her death. And it's crazy. It's, I was exactly like her, except for the sexuality thing. It was crazy. It was, 
Yeah, and that's, thank you for sharing that. That's the real harm that religion has caused young people. That's why so many young people have walked away from it. Um, and I, my hope is that we can also think about people who have benefited from it too, that there's two sides to the coin, that religion is also responsible for social services, hospitals, universities, homeless services, all sorts of things that are actually positive things in our world that we should be focused on as human beings. And it's a difficult time, I think, to think through this because it's happening in real time. I'm not the kind of person who thinks that everyone needs religion or God in order to thrive or flourish, but I am. I do believe we need the things that religion has historically provided people to thrive and flourish, even if it's not religion. So I tell my students, what's sacred to you? It doesn't matter. Maybe it's sports, music, maybe it's service, maybe it's your animals, maybe it's your podcast, but what gets you up in the morning, not just what keeps you up at night and whatever is sacred to you, have that be your North Star, own it, honor it, cherish it give it real value because what we need as human beings is we need purpose and the things that are sacred to us give us a purpose in life. Yeah, which is beautifully said. Another part of love to how did you meet Victoria? And do you have any behind <laughs> well, the scenes stories about her that you can repeat on this sure. podcast? Of course. <laughs> I think that obviously you're a fan of Victoria and I am as well. I met Victoria as a student at USC. I, some of your listeners may know her story. If not, it's worth checking her podcast out too, which is how you and I met. Victoria was a D1 athlete at USC in volleyball. And USC has got an incredible athletic tradition, more Olympians and more championships than any other university. And so to be an athlete at USC is a pretty amazing accomplishment, but it's also something I think that is comes with a lot of pressure. And Victoria was really brave as an undergraduate because she talked about that pressure in ways that I hadn't seen other athletes talk about. She talked about the mental health challenges of the spotlight and what that meant emotionally. She gave a TED talk when she was in college about that kind of went viral. She was talking about this even before Naomi Osaka and Michael Phelps. And so in some ways she was talking about the challenges of being a high performing athlete at a time when no one else was. And when she graduated from college, she continued to talk about things that really mattered. And over time, she created this amazing podcast called The Real Pod. And she has an incredible guests and it is real. It's real talk from her real experiences. What I love about her journey is that her audience in many ways grew up with her. I tell her she reminds me of Miley Cyrus. They, yes, they, I they, was listening to one of your episodes to prepare for today. Yeah. And that Miley Cyrus reference is so, when she first came out with that MTV VMA performance, I, like a lot of people, was appalled. And I'm not like condoning it at all. But I think she... Like the way she went about it could have been better, but she needed that in a way to shed herself of the Hannah Montana, yeah. wholesome, di- and do what she wanted to do. And I feel like your reference was so insane because that is so right on and astute of you. To- Thank you. I, I, and I, my pop cultural references are, are usually not astute, so <laughs> it's a compliment. <laughs> I, I think she also has brought an audience along with her who might have tuned into her when they were in college and now they're going through what she's going through, relationships and career. And so what I love about Victoria is that she's evolved alongside her audience. She's no longer the volleyball player talking about the pressures of being a high performing athlete. Now she's talking about the challenges of being in a career or in a marriage or in telling a new story after you graduate from college. And her audience is walking alongside her. And so she, she's, I've learned so much from her and one of my favorite students ever. Yes, she's, and she's so inclusive to our community too. She's so inclusive to the disabled community at 25. If she can be this inclusive at 25 or however old she is, she's going to be fine in 20 years, no matter what she ends up doing. Speaking of the My Size Hannah Montana thing, do we put ourselves in these boxes. What do you think we need to really be happy and all of these people? <laughs> these are your great questions. It's going to sound a little cliche and it may sound a little cheesy, but what the data tells us, what the research tells us, even what spirituality tells us 
is the number one factor for us to feel like we're happy, to feel like we're flourishing, to feel like we are living a life worth living, to feel like we have meaning in our life. The number one thing is deep and loving relationships. That's it. How deep is your love? How deep are your relationships? That doesn't mean you have to have a lot of them. You just have to go deep. Can you have three or four people who are like ride or die friends who have your back no matter what in a non-judgmental way? That's really what we need. We don't need 100,000 friends online. We just need a few friends in real life who really care for us, who will walk alongside us, who won't judge us, who will be there no matter what. And um, at the end of our lives, we're going to think about our lives based on the relationships we had, not based on the money we made, not based on the education we have, not based on the career we have. We're going to think we're successful if we had love, and we're going to think we're not successful if we didn't. And so I don't think we have to wait till the end of our lives to figure this out if we already know that's what the data tells us. Instead, right now, we can think deeply about how we develop the deep and loving relationships that will sustain us so that we don't get to the end of our lives with any regrets about not doing that. So I think the most important thing is your are your relationships, your loving relationships. Everything else is a, is noise, honestly. Which is, you just blew my mind. Okay. Anything else you want to add before we get off here? I'm really happy to have this conversation with you because you bring a lot of joy into this conversation, into the world. Thank and you. I think that's what we need to be focused on. My teacher, Deepak Chopra, who he told me there are five crises in the world today. Four are crises that we all know about and we all work on, we all try to work on in our own way. War, justice, health, and sustainability. But the fifth crisis, he said, is a crisis that's the most important to address. It's a crisis that all of us can be a part of the solution for. And if we don't solve this crisis, we can't solve any other crisis. And he said, that crisis is a crisis of joy. And so I just want to applaud you for bringing joy into this conversation <laughs> and into the world. Encourage your listeners to be unapologetic about finding joy in their life. We don't need permission to have an aspiration to joy. Joy is, in many ways, our, our North Star as human beings. And that doesn't mean happiness. We're not always happy. Happiness comes and goes. Happiness is often based on the things we can't control in the outside world. But joy is something that we can generate inside ourselves, regardless of what's happening in the outside world. And joy, I think, is the is what we need more than anything in the world right now. And so I would just leave this conversation on joy. That's how we started the conversation. You brought so much joy into this. And I want, I want you to continue to do that because well, you do that for all of us. Thank you, sir. I, I've struggled with anxiety and depression. So it's weird to hear that, but thank you. I see and feel joy. Thank you. you. So where can people follow you on social media? Do you have any? Yeah, I'm, unfortunately, I'm, I'm not really on social media, but they can always just reach out to me, email me, or, or find me through USC. I'll put your email address in the show notes, if that's okay with you. Totally. That's great. So you blew my mind. Thank you so much for being here. And again, I didn't think we were going to get you, but thank you so much for being here. And we will see you guys next episode. Bye, guys. Thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoyed the show. Remember to follow the show and our guests on social media and subscribe.